Om Bhadram Karnabihi Srinayama Devaha Bhadram Bhasyema Akshabirya Jatraha Stirai Ranga Ishtushtuvamsas Tanuvir Vyashema Devahitam Yadayuhu May we see with these eyes what is good and spiritual. May we hear with these ears what is noble and uplifting. And may we, while worshipping the Lord and Mother with healthy minds and bodies, live a life which is beneficial to ourselves and to all other beings. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Good morning and welcome to our live streaming and our live satsang after meditation on this Sunday morning, followed later in the afternoon by our class on <clears throat> Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. Today we're live streaming to various points in the world where the SRV students and others are watching, West Coast and East Coast, because we are in the Hawaiian Islands right now, and also to other places in the United States and in India where other students are watching. And we have arrived at satsang in the early morning here in Hawaii at about 7.15 a.m. and various times that you're all watching. So we have received questions already from our audience, uh, both live and, and live streaming. <clears throat> and we will enter into the spirit of Atma Vichara, self inquiry, for finding out the nature of the self. And I might also add checking into the nature of the not self, which is an important part of the whole process, too, that one needs to know all the steps inside and connect the dots back inside the cosmological process, which we're quite known for here at SRV, talking about the underpinnings of the cosmological part of the philosophy of India, the 24 cosmic principles of Samkhya, and uh, other philosophical mainstays, which allow us to examine and identify the not-self, uh, those things which are constantly changing, because we all have heard that eternal truth that the Brahman or Atman, Chaitanya, is eternally indivisible and unchanging, immutable. And that becomes the pillar upon which we base our understanding of Brahman or the Almighty or Allah or however you call it in different traditions. So it's always necessary and even sometimes welcome to uh, look at the not-self, maya, sometimes it's called, or samsara, and examine it. But Sri Ramakrishna said, when you look at maya, don't identify with it and uh, observe it from a distance. We find out that in our lives and in our walks of life that are going on here in, in this present time, <clears throat> that quite often our systems and our various sciences and so forth begin to examine maya and it sucks them in until they forget the observer. It's, uh, only the observed is, uh, that is, the object instead of the subject, as my teacher used to say. You're the eternal subject and these objects are manifestations of the mind, as we will learn today from some of our teachings in the Tibetan Buddhist fold, which we will look into this afternoon in the live streaming class. So in Atma Vichara, we come forward to say examination of the not-self and inquiry into the nature of the true self, or Atman, is very important. The Atman and the Anatman, if you want to put it that way. And many of the questions that come in from our students are oriented towards that kind of thinking. For instance, we'll start here at the back and go forward. This question from one student comes in. My question has to do with the fire of yoga. When Holy Mother, that is our Sri Sharda Devi, Sri Ramakrishna's holy consort, was asked if she remembered her true nature at all time, she replied it was not possible because of attention 
on actions or duties. She also said, however, that at any time she wished she could see her Atman. Is it possible to be unaware of the self in action and not create karma? What does it mean to burn karma in the fire of yoga and how is that done? So referring to some conversations that were recorded about our blessed Sri Sharda Devi, whom we call the Holy Mother, who is the guru of my guru and the ideal of the SRV ashrams. One story comes forth that Holy Mother was asked about um, whether or not you could remain conscious of God at every second at all times. And she said, no, of course not. There's all this work to do. So it's as if she's inferring that action and inaction are contradictory to one another. Or if you want to put it in a high spir spiritual way, that when you're in a non-dual samadhi, then you're completely unaware of the world. That's not a fact that's understood by very many people. They th sort of think that samadhi has to include the world. Spiritual life has to include the world. Your analysis of the self and the non-self has to include the world, but don't superimpose the world over nirvikalpa samadhi. Nirvikalpa samadhi, that is what we would call a sampragyata in yoga, the highest samadhi or state of awareness is formless, nameless, free of worlds, free of thoughts which create worlds, vibrations that is. It's even transcendent of the word om, which is the source, the cause of all cause. It's the causeless cause we're talking about when we talk about Brahman. Uh, when we're talking about the word, we're talking about the unstruck sound, that, that which goes on vibrating forever and out of which everything is produced. Sri Ramakrishna said he saw everything going back into Om and coming out of Om when he had a very high state of consciousness. But that was still in the realm of witness, witnesser and witnessed. That is, there's a slight state of separation that allows one to see everything through the refined filter of bliss called Sananda. I see there's another question here that asks, to, that asks about Sananda Samadhi that's the samadhi of bliss. So there's the experience of I'm having bliss. So there's still an I there. But when you go to the formless level, there is no I there. There's just one homogeneous state of pure conscious awareness, which is of course indescribable and inexplicable. It comes upon the meditator almost uh, unasked for and by some unseen grace, some unseen hand. And one goes into a state of absolute identity. That is yoga at the highest level. So the fire of yoga in the meantime, this question asks about is that which burns away everything that keeps one from going into that state. And those are things that are quite precious to people, including their ego. That is, they're not going to want those things to be burned away. But what they do want to be burned away and so that they can get into that state of bliss is these karmas that are also mentioned here in the question. So it, it's put here, is it possible to be unaware of the self in action and not create karma? Yes, it is, in the way that Holy Mother is saying it here. When she said, it's not possible to be aware of God at all times because of this work to do, she's talking about practical matters. She's not talking about a spiritual life that she's already mastered. So we have somebody who is a master or a past master, then they're on automatic pilot, if you want to put it that way. They can take their mind off of God as the way we practitioners would think of it. Uh, oh, I have to keep thinking about God. I'm trying to create a samskara or a habit of thinking about God all the time, bringing God into my everyday life. It's a good effort and a good thought and a good ideal, but you have to know that oil and water don't mix, as we often illustrate by our uh, putting together oil and water in a capped off vessel and shaking it and showing the kids. And then we see that oil and water mixes for about 45 seconds and then separates. So uh, it's good to bring God into life, that is thoughts of God and all that, to di divinize reality, to, to uh, um, cause everything to, to uh, radiate with divinity. But you have to know that as soon as, as, uh, as one realizes the 
unreal and insubstantial nature of the world and objects that consciousness is going to separate from it, just like it does at death, separates from the body. So that natural separation process is, as I was saying earlier, a part of the Samkhya teaching. It's right there in the very beginning of India's ancient philosophies, is that there is, there is a manifestation of evolutes and then there's a demanifestation of evolutes. Everything pours out of the word and then it gets dissolved back into the world, word in very long cycles. Or it's also happening even in the cycle of one in-breath and one held-breath and one out-breath, that that's, that's also going on in an eternal moment. Well, those are very precious truths and must be experienced by the meditator when he can, he or she can, see everything in one breath or in one moment and begin to get close to that special uh, experience called samadhi. And you will go through different stages of samadhi on the way, as we will look at next. But, yes, it is possible to uh, go on automatic pilot, as I said, and these beings are so masterful in their realization of divine reality within them and in everything that it's no problem for them to take their mind off of a sort of um, um, having to concentrate all the time on divine reality kind of sadhana that we that we find ourselves as practitioners trying to concentrate our mind and bring it away from distractions distractions aren't in the picture for them anymore peace of mind is their default zone that's why Holy Mother herself said you need peace of mind first and foremost so if you have peace of mind and you attain peace of mind then you can get the peace that passes all understanding as Christ said later but you have this basic ground now where you never waver away from that peace of mind. That is, things like slothfulness, restlessness, that is, those two gunas, they call them, of, of uh, tamas and rajas, do not interfere anymore with your life. You're just naturally in a, in a one-pointed or equanimous condition of mind. So then, at that point, you've mastered yoga, as a practice, and the fire of yoga is already burning in you all the time. It's burning away everything simultaneously as you're doing it. It's a very marvelous state of mind that we find, but we found Holy Mother's um, disciple, our own teacher, Swami Sheshananda, in that state of mind all the time. Anything that comes to you in life gets burnt away on the spot and turned to ashes. And those ashes you put on your forehead and Shiva covers himself with and uh, the ashes of, of uh, renunciation, as it were. So, the answer to the question then, yes, it is possible, and no karma will accrue to that person because the fire of yoga is already burning in them. It's always burning in them. For the rest of us, we'll have to take recourse to those divine actions called sadhana that will continue tending the fire and keep it burning all the time. Uh, that is, the next weekend we go into a Zen Buddhist retreat here at SRV Ashram called Zen Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. And we're showing those precious teachings in both those traditions and simultaneously one lineage starting in India, going through China, ending up in Japan. So in that way they talk about a stage of ox tending, ox herding, that uh, gives up discrimination, but uh, that is goes beyond the need to discriminate between the real and the unreal. But if you remain in the world t to help others, then you're going to have to man that station again and again. It's not something you give up and then run off and have some sort of personal ecstasy for yourself. Um, that's, of course, possible, but it's rather selfish, spiritually speaking. When you have a world full of suffering and your ideal is someone like Swami Vivekananda and he's not going to want you to run off and have your own individual moksha or mukti, your liberation, he's going to want you to get that moksha and mukti and then return to the world and help others. Then you're going to have to keep your discrimination between the real and the unreal very well honed for several reasons. Number one is that you're going to need it to help others and number two is that you're going to be taking on the, the collective karma of others. You might not 
have to deal with your individual karma anymore because you've already supposedly or hopefully mastered that and you have the fire of yoga well tended in you but you're going to have to take on the karmas of others so you're going to have to hold on to stations like discrimination and peace of mind that should be said in the face of these non-dualistic teachings as a sort of cautionary measure for people who think that maybe they can jump steps, jump stages. So that's uh, somewhat of an explication of this beautiful question that's put here that has several facets about it, but let's go on to another one. Um, but the answer being, yes, uh, it is possible for those exceptional souls to take, put their mind on action, but still naturally and spontaneously be aware of God all the time, whereas others are going to have to sort of uh, be more careful about not letting maya seep into the cracks of their thinking consciousness or in, in sleep tonight or in dream and so forth, have to keep up a practice. So that is burning karma with the fire of yoga and, and it's done by meditation and by com combined with, with knowledge. It is study of scriptures, memorization of scriptures, chanting, and uh, sat songs like this with uh, the Sangha. And also your devotions at the altar, which we did last night. Our shrine now is covered with flowers this morning because we had our Saturday night puja last night and did our worship of Divine Mother of the Universe and all the deities. And then also, then your karma yoga will become, all of your actions will become a means to an end instead of uh, that kind of futile feeling that, that we get or we see when beings are engaged in action and uh, they're just spinning their wheels, as it were, and going nowhere faster, as the expression says. So with that explanation of this question, let's go on to this idea of samadhis. This question comes, concerns the contents of some pragyata samadhis. What kind of experience in terms of thoughts, visions, etc. are characteristic of Savitarka and Nirvitarka and Savichara and Nirvichara and Sasmita and Sananda Samadhis. To rephrase the question for the sake of clarity, the saints and sages describe various experiences and I assume that what they're usually describing is the content of those Samadhis. How does the content change as one moves up the ladder of the Samadhis? Well, this person's obviously been taking our Raja Yoga study course through the email that is available to all people and um, has been thinking about and hearing about the teachings of Samadhis because Lord Patanjali, the father of the Ashtanga or Eight-Limbed Yoga, the authentic yoga, has been putting these teachings of Samadhi in a nicely ordered, well-ordered way and you find that he classifies them from knowledge samadhi starting beginning and then uh, moving onwards and the knowledge samadhis are also divided into uh, discursive knowledge they say sometimes and then also um, uh, the inner knowledge you might say or, or finding the, the outer knowledge and the inner knowledge or knowledge with objects and knowledge beyond objects uh, it's a very interesting study of that lower samadhi. One of the first samadhis that most people would encounter. Of course, there are bliss samadhis called bhavas or moods, which the bhaktas, the devotees, sometimes encounter even before that. By doing their worship or by chanting, or by singing and dancing, kirtan and those kinds of things, they encounter some bhavas or blissful moods, they're called. So those are types of samadhis too, one might say. Although when they're intensified, uh, the dancing stops and the singing stops. And that's what he's referring to here when he talks about beyond Savitarka and Nirvitarka, then one begins to go into Sasmita. Sasmita is, Asmita means ego. So you, get, you begin to get a, a um, feeling of uh, egolessness, but also accompanied by a sense of subtle ego. So sasmita means with ego. So you're beginning to have this experience of uh, bliss, which is sananda, which is coming, and this sasmita samadhi is beginning to attend you. So that's 
not the usual ego that you're talking about there, arrogance and, and problems and so forth like that, but you're beginning to feel this sense of subtle self, like the inception of an individual being that happened uh, earlier, way back in a series of lifetimes. So those, those samadhis are very subtle samadhis, and it's as if knowledge has already been had, and the ego is now aware of that knowledge and is aware that it comes out of its own self and is aware of a higher self too because it's making the distinction between lower self and higher self at that point. It's feeling that line of demarcation. And it also wants to break through that boundary. So then it begins to, as it does break through that boundary, feel sananda, this bliss of, the samadhi of bliss. So these are all, I just had to give a little bit of an explanation about the way Patanjali classifies these samadhis from from gross knowledge to subtle knowledge and, and then the knowledge, the idea of, of bliss and, and the subtle ego that, that goes with it. And then as he says here, he assumes that when the saints and seers are talking about these experiences they have, that those must be <coughs> in accordance with these different samadhis. So it's an interesting turnaround. We always think of having samadhi, trying to get samadhi, but those beings who have attained samadhi already are now walking around in a state of samadhi that's that's becoming less and more intense uh, during the day, during the period of practice, during during daily activities, are actually seeing things in terms of samadhi. That is, one person could could look at a tree and just see a tree, and another person could look at the tree and and from a biological standpoint, see what kind of tree it is and, and see the fruits on the tree and the leaves and the, tent, the various um, ingredients of a tree. But another person could look at the same tree and see swirling particles. Yet another person could look at that same tree and just see the Buddha nature tree or the Atman tree, depending on what state of mind they're in. So you might say that this question the way it's posed is that the saints are describing various experiences in accord with the levels of samadhis that they're actually having. So it's interesting because you're actually converting everything into Brahman, is rather the idea there. Is that most people, as I say, you're trying to see Brahman and everything. But if you have samadhi, you actually convert everything into Brahman. You actually see all as God. And so it's not a seeking anymore. And once you have that tendency, uh, brought about also by the fire of yoga, as the last question brought up here, is that you're, you're just really burning away maya, or the appearance of things, everywhere you go. And you're, then you're seeing the underlying reality behind all appearances. It's uh, a classic way in which to get into yoga, and also a very unique way uh, how to see yoga, how to utilize it. So yes, the content changes in that way as we move up the ladder of samadhis, as he says here. Uh, if you're in a samadhi of uh, Savitarka, then you're, you're um, seeing everything as knowledge. You're gaining knowledge out of every little thing. But then pretty soon, um, that knowledge puts you in a state of, of um, stunned consciousness. Jada Samadhi, it puts you in a state of uh, overwhelm, you might say. An overwhelm of, there is an overwhelm of bhakti, we know that. There's also an overwhelm of knowledge, of wisdom. Basically, it comes from the fact that you're looking at everything outward and getting knowledge from it, but then all of a sudden you realize and you make that connection that all of this has come from inside. The kingdoms of heaven are within you or the world is just a manifestation of the mind. And the ego, we know, is a very big part of that mind. It's a fourfold mind, ego, dual mind, intelligence, and um, thoughts. It's called antakarna, the inner, the, the inner cause of everything. So they named the fourfold mind very well in early India. And they saw right away that all of this out, outward was just caused by the mind's vibrations so that when you when you stop the mind's vibrations, yoga, chitta, vritti, niroda, he says in the sutras, 
Patanjali that is, then the world tends to go away just like it does tonight when you go into sleep. You tend to rest, the vibrations become less, the breathing becomes less, and you go into a sort of formless state. Deep sleep puts a capper on it. You're, you've actually brought everything back to its original cause, the word. And you, you merge like a hailstone in an ocean, but you don't do it consciously. In meditation, then, you wake up and you go to meditation and say, let's try and do this consciously, turn off these vibrations with my will and my desire for enlightenment at the background of that impetus and see if I can do this consciously. And so you begin to, with the fire of yoga again, open these channels, these nadis, back into the hub of the heart hundreds and thousands of subtle nerve endings and uh, everything flowing outward and all of a sudden I've turned the energy and, and, and gone with it by, with the prana and now I'm, I'm uh, merging it all back into its original source but I'm along for the ride this time see my consciousness wasn't there when I did that in deep sleep but now I'm along for the ride because I'm at the controls see, I'm at the steering wheel so this meditation then uh, Te Dhyan Yoga Nugata Pashyan Devatma Shaktim Svagunair Nagudam. In the earliest times, the Rishi saw the Devatma Shakti in meditation. And that gave them all the impetus they needed to transcend the limitations of their own intellect. So, yes, these samadhis are gradated, and I would say that it would be a good way to look at it to think maybe beyond the box there in the fact that I'm having samadhis and things are changing rather is that because I'm having samadhi everything is being stripped away and and it's showing up its real nature again whether it's changing or unchanging is the point that's the point of self inquiry to find the not self and to take it away and then see the self and Whatever yoga you're using will accomplish that very same thing. Bhakti will do the very same thing. You'll love God so much that the world will go away in bhakti. In jnanam, you yourself again are not leaving anything to chance. You're at the controls, as I said, and you're uh, beginning to approach samadhi as something to attain. But then pretty soon you get the idea and samadhi happens to you and you see everything as its true nature and there is no change at all. I and thou are one, uh, as the bhaktis say. And so then thou art that, is how the Advaitist would say. So I hope that um, expands a little bit on, these, on this question and also explains some of the terms for those who aren't so much in the know yet about all the different divisions of samadhi that are listed there in the Raja Yoga system of Patanjali. Um, another question here comes from one of our students here in Hawaii. It says, I was raised in the Christian church where belief is considered to be all important. Perhaps it was the idea that there had to be something more than this that led me to the Eastern path. My question is, in spiritual life, how does one avoid remaining stuck in the realm of belief to actually take steps on the path of direct knowledge? It's a question that many of us consider and have considered and probably continue to consider even into advanced stages of practice is that uh, doubt is one of the last things to die. So doubt in the beginning is, is uh, not so subtle. It's, it's basically whether I'm going to believe or I'm not going to believe. But as one uh, teacher once, I heard one teacher say once, God is infinite and God is everywhere this is the absolute truth. Um, it's beyond mere belief. So that beginning level of practice, whereas one is, is uh, encountering whether God exists or not, is sort of the, at the foundation of one's early practice, one's early sadhana. And of course we know that, as I've often told, in the beginning, in India, in philosophically speaking, they never posed a question. 
They just said God is existence. It's not whether God exists or God doesn't exist. It's not the question. To be or not to be is not the question. You are is the answer. So uh, you have to get away from dualities like being and becoming and settle yourself in sort of the middle path, see, in a foundation like that, in a, in a substratum, as Samkhya says, and make a siddhanta, a conclusion about it. So those are the kind of things that begin to do away with the existence of mere belief and begin to settle one into direct faith. Now, faith is what you're headed for, and in Vedanta, it's based on learning how to discriminate between the real and the unreal. That's called viveka. Note the word because it's Swami Vivekananda's name he took monastically. And then you go on to, to um, uh, concentrating on the real that you found by that process, that process and doing away with the unreal. So that's called vairagya or detachment. That is detachment from the unreal and then focusing on what's left over, the essence. And that still doesn't net you faith yet. You're still laboring some in, under some sort of mantle or veil of, of belief. You're still trying to gain some uh, advantage over the mind in maya, which is still proposing and throwing up these ideas of maybe I'm wrong, or maybe this is the wrong way to go, or maybe religion is, is all crazy. Or maybe that, that teacher, those teachers are, are not telling the truth. See? Or maybe they're all just deluded or pretending. So many doubts are thrown up along the way. And of course, when one finds their swadharma, their real teacher and their real path, then all of that begins to go away very quickly. And uh, you see by example, like we saw with Holy Mother's devotee, Swami Sheshananda Ji Maharaj, uh, that there's a man that's living in the spirit. Whether God exists or not doesn't really even come into uh, consideration around him because he's just walking around on two legs. He's God walking around on two legs and he doesn't have any doubt about it. He's been living in that state for lifetimes most likely. So in that case of course then you have an exemplar which immediately does away with all doubts and that's a great help. Holy company, they call it along along the road of life. But in the meantime, in order to engender this deeper faith that gets rid of belief, then you want to have inner peace and self-control, sama and dhamma. This is called the two uh, help uh, uh, guardians along the road of life. They keep the thieves and, and, and uh, problems away from you, you see. So you, te you keep inner peace and self-control with you. You're always practicing self-control, that is, keeping the senses from wandering, and like five horses, tasting, seeing, hearing, smelling, and, and, uh, and so forth, from going on different roads. You keep them under control, self-control, and then you get some inner peace <coughs> from that. That is, inner peace comes to you because you have been able to control the various outward-going senses and the factions that are there, the objects and so forth. That immediately begins to destroy doubt when you have some inner peace and you have that confidence in yourself, doubt will go away naturally. It's not something you have to go chase down and destroy. It begins to disappear. And then after that, then you get forbearance because you need patience for this practice to happen. And titiksha it's called. And after forbearance, then you get a, a contentment that arises from that. Uparati, it's called. And with that contentment or self-settledness, sometimes they call it, then you uh, get a special dispensation from the Divine Mother of the Universe to be able to concentrate upon God without any interruption. It's like this question here says. See. Even on automatic pilot, you can concentrate on God. Even when you're not concentrating on God, you're concentrating on God. It's just uh, at that point, mere belief has turned into faith, and that's the next step, shraddha. From that special ability to concentrate on nothing but God alone, or but only God alone, then you get shraddha, faith. So it's a beautiful way in which the, these are called the four, four treasures and the six jewels. 
It's a, be a beautiful way in which Vedanta explains the spiritual progress of a soul that along the way gets rid of such things as doubt, rude ignorance. Um, the only thing left then at the end of that fire of yoga, that particular way of explaining the fire of yoga is mumukshutvam. You end up with a pure desire to realize God. And it's, it's a desire of its own class. Uh, that is, um, you can rely upon it. Uh, you couldn't rely upon earlier forms of, of desire to realize God because um, it wasn't, the process wasn't matured in you yet. And those doubts kept coming up, and those doubts actually affected you. Well, maybe here doubts keep coming up occasionally, but they don't affect you anymore. Rather like like sometimes Holy Mother and Sri Krishna would say, burnt ropes can't bind you. In fact, a wind comes along and you know, a puff of wind will destroy them, but they still look like ropes, burnt ropes. They still have that shape, but they can't bind anyone anymore. So. Those are those kinds of desires at that stage. Any doubts that come up are sort of like burnt ropes or burnt strings. They have the appearance of, of being able to bind you. They occur in your mind, but they have no binding power left in them. So that is a stage of transitioning uh, back to the samadhis again. You know, the the four, four to eight kinds of samadhis that Patanjali has listed that we just talked about in the last question. That's also very interconnected with that. You, you go through the same thing with knowledge. Where you see the knowledge, you doubt what you've seen, and then you go and inspect it, and it overwhelms you. And at that point, you can't doubt it anymore. You can't doubt that all of this has come from inside of you, that the kings of heaven are within you. So that step you took was the destroyer of doubt. So you have that many help help uh, mates along the way. You have Saman, Dhamma, inner peace, and self-control. You have the exemplar, your guru. You have the Dharma teachings, which are knowledge, which come from inside of you. All of these things destroy doubt. Now it's just up to you to uh, keep doubt, fear, and ignorance at bay. So my teacher used to say, make doubt doubt itself. Make fear afraid of itself and put death in its own grave make ignorance ignorant of itself. So that's a sort of Zen koan way or Advaita Vedanta way of, of dealing with those things, which are a part of the mind. You, uh, Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother used to say, people would ask them, can we get rid of our lust and get rid of our anger and so forth? No, 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 you'll never be able to get rid of them. Don't think like that. Just keep them at a minimum. Because you have a human mind, so mind is a part of those things the six passions, the eight fetters, the, the five kleshas or obstacles, the nine anturyayas or impediments to yoga, all of these things are a part of your mind. If your path was smooth, then you wouldn't develop any muscles, any hiking muscles. But if you have to jump rocks and go around crevices and, and climb mountains, then you develop some very strong inner muscles. And you're going to need those to get to the highest citadel of realization or enlightenment. So you know, those things are a part of the process. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, people say and they blame religion for all problems, but uh, uh, it was God that put all these imperfections in religion. And so people would stop and have to think about that, you see. It was God that put these imperfections in religion. It's not that it should turn you away from religion, it's that you should use religion to get to the highest uh, level of consciousness, beyond religions, the open space beyond all religion, as our founder used to say. So that is a, an evolution that takes place, spiritually speaking, inside of the, the human soul, will transcend those tendencies of doubt, fear, and ignorance. So that all in context of this question of belief. When you say that uh, belief is considered to be all important in Christianity, it's uh, all important as a beginning step uh, because there are the believers and the non-believers. 
uh, in our tradition it would be you know th- those uh, uh, who are worldly and those who are spiritually minded or grant unto Caesar what is Caesar's and take unto yourself what is the Lord's whatever way you want to put it in whichever era that uh, you study uh, you find out that there's this natural division between the divine and the demoniacal it's actually how Krishna puts it in the Bhagavad Gita in one of the later chapters the division between the divine and the demoniacal demoniacal here doesn't mean uh, devil incarnate it means all those devilish things which Christ wanted you to get behind me see, and which Buddha also encountered in his meditations under the bow tree so Mara he called it or Maya we call it those kinds of things you are are doubt causing are fear causing fear inspiring and uh, terrifying but beyond the terrifying there's the terrific I mean Kali is terrifying when you look at her from a distance but when you come up close she's terrific you see and there's a different connotation of that word so all of a sudden that thing that gave you the most fear the most doubt and it was actually those things that brought up your own ignorance therefore were the greatest helpmates along the way like in Tibetan Buddhism you know the the wrathful deities when we were talking about uh, Tibetan Buddhism this afternoon at class the wrathful deities are actually challenges inside of you that bring your attention to things that are lacking in you or test you or ch- you know challenges so in that way we, f- we see the demise of doubt and we see that, that fear is finite see? and we put those things uh, get those things behind us and belief plays a part but it has to, tr- it has to strengthen and turn into a special kind of concentration that allows you to get faith beyond belief is faith another question here in spiritual life it seems there are many ways in which the mind can go astray believing it is acquiring knowledge with actual, when actually it is not what are some of the most troublesome sticking points and what is the role of the good or disciple relationship in helping to navigate through them successfully uh, I would put the question the last part of that question in a different context and say uh, rather than asking what the relationship of the guru disciple is about is just to go get a guru and become a disciple Let's, let's put it as clearly as we can here that if you have a disease, you go to a doctor, and if you have a court case, you go to a lawyer. But when you want to know the nature of the self and the nature of reality, you find a spiritual teacher, and you just have to have certain criterion for that. The first criterion is a kamahata. The teacher should not have any desire other than you get enlightenment. A kama means no desire. You can really uh, put that in different interpretations, but basically it means no desire for you other than that you get enlightenment. Because if it's a true guru, you shouldn't have any desires anyway. That should all be um, burned away in the fire of yoga. The only desire he has left is to see the temple of humanity built in you, in shining gold, you see. Uh, construct it in the land of awareness and, and see people meditate in it. Then, Abhrijana must live a pure and stainless life that is unostentatious, simple, simplified is best. And also, uh, Shrotriya must, must have uh, knowledge of the scriptures and be able to transmit it to you. Uh, so, you say here, uh, the question is, acquires knowledge when actually is not acquiring knowledge. There's lower knowledge and there's higher knowledge. Lower knowledge is aparavidya, higher knowledge is paravidya. As long as you know the distinction between the two, you can get into both of them. But if you just get stuck in lower knowledge, sciences, arts, crafts, uh, languages, mathematics, science, then you haven't seen the source of things yet. You're still looking at manifestations, effects of causes. You haven't seen the cause or the causeless cause, the stainless cause yet. So you're going to have to um, qualify 
that lower knowledge by seeking parvid, the highest knowledge, which has to do with scriptures and beyond. Scriptures is a low, sometimes they classify scriptures as a paravidya because it can be a way of making money. It can be a profession. It can be a priest. It can be a, 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 a you know, a churchgoer, see, a leader of a congregation, and so forth. And that can tend to weigh you down, uh, uh, keep you from having higher spiritual realization. And you're just pretty much reciting scriptures and slokas and, and reading out of the Bible and, and reciting the surahs of the Quran and the slokas of the Vedanta and the sutras of the yoga. Whatever, uh, whatever the case may be, you haven't had the direct experience yet of what you're speaking. The story is the bullock carries sweets to the marketplace on its back, but it can't taste them. So that's how they explain a person in that predicament. So if that's the case, then you must have paravidya, a higher level of direct spiritual experience. And that's going to uh, not only take you above a paravidya, but it's going to also justify par a paravidya, the lower knowledge. It's going to put it in its own position as something useful and practical to you. But Paravidya is going to go beyond money making and professions and all that kind of thing and take you into a high state of samadhi, different states of samadhi as we were saying. So there's a way of knowing the difference between knowledge that binds uh, and, and knowledge that liberates. That's a good way of putting it. A Paravidya without Paravidya binds intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge, worldly knowledge. But uh, a paravidya, that's a paravidya, but paravidya frees, liberates you, and turns all of that lower knowledge you once had very useful to you and in helping others to also transcend and get direct spiritual experience. Some of the most troublesome sticking points, and then we should begin to wrap it up, uh, the guru disciple relationship will take care of those for you uh, because if you go amongst holy company, sadhu satsanga, then you, you get shanti, you get some peace, and you get santosha, contentment, and then you get mahatseva, the desire to help others. That's called the four sentinels of life, the teaching by Lord Vashishta. So, whole a good or disciple relationship will be used in the highest way in that reckoning. Uh, sticking points along the way are problems of the ego, um, mostly, and then there are karmas and samskaras, and if they come up in the light of everyday happenings or occurrences, then most people give up the path if they even started it in the first place. But if these karmas and some scars and problems come up in the light of good or disciple relationship or in holy company um, and higher knowledge, I mean, we have to be careful when we say holy company, we don't just mean like a congregation without a leader. We have to have a, a leader who is enlightened. That's why I said Kamahata, Avrijana, Shrotriya, and Brahmavid was the last one. You must have a knower of Brahman as your teacher. And if those four things are there, no desire for you except you get enlightened, knowledge of the scriptures and transmit it, um, leads a pure and unostentatious life and knows Brahman, then you're talking about holy company. But there are plenty of congregations with so-called teachers that one does not feel holy when one attends. And one does not come away with the feeling of holiness or the feeling of my karmas have been destroyed and I've seen God and now... <laughs> I mean, let's be real clear, spirituality is a very rare thing. Religion is more common. And pseudo-religion is even more common, unfortunately. It's pretty much widespread. So when we want to, as Vivekananda says, bring back religion with a capital R, we're talking about holy company is the justifier, is the gauge, is the measure. So you must be able to go to a a, a satsang or a congregation or a holy company and, and emerge with that feeling that I've heard something rare and unique here. And, uh, and then you must run with that. You must take it and go with it. 
and uh, then you will be avoiding a lot of those sticking points that are going to happen with the ego. Now, those will come up in the atmosphere of Holy Company. As you get a real authentic teacher and a bunch of very good followers, you feel like an outsider first, and you go there and you try and measure yourself up to it. You'll hear a lot of things which your ego doesn't like, and then you'll hear a lot of things that you very much think are, are uh, truth. And, uh, and then you must develop an ability to take those truths that you hear and uh, concentrate on them, and that will destroy your doubt. You'll find out that all the things that you thought you disagreed with later will either are of little merit or they will just dis disappear like smoke in thin air. So it's the truths that you really relate to, that you hear, that you should concentrate on. If you're looking for remedies and solutions, uh, then you'll just find out that you can find a solution to a remedy, but then another uh, disease comes up. And you're going on in a kind of vicious cycle like that. But if you can hear these truths and apply them towards karmas, samskaras, ego problems, then those will tend to die away and thin out and die away. And then you'll find yourself in a ripe condition for samadhi, for knowledge samadhi. And after knowledge samadhi will come bliss samadhi, and bliss samadhi will turn into egolessness, selflessness. So you're really moving from selfishness to selflessness. And those things that are there along the way, well, there's a, there's a story Holy Mother told uh, that if you get on a train in Calcutta and you get off a train in Benares, then along the way, uh, you fell asleep, so you didn't see any of the landscape go by, but you woke up at your destination. You'll find out that all of those things that are problems in you, uh, if you keep your mind on the goal, that uh, those will seem completely unreal, uh, as if they never had any substance whatsoever, just like falling asleep along a train, you didn't see any of the landscape, but you woke up in a condition at your destination, you see, in a condition of enlightenment. So she talked about those things, resist not evil style, as not really uh, having any merit. Pay them no never mind, as the expression says, because uh, those are those stumbling blocks along the path that only, do, if you know, for the, for the intrepid spiritual traveler, they're going to build muscles. They're going to cut their teeth on those obstacles. And that's what you want to build character. Character is the real essence of spiritual life, she said, not mystery mongering, occult powers, visions, and so forth. Character is what you want. And that will destroy doubt, fear, ignorance, and put you in a state of enlightenment in this lifetime. That's what we want. May we reach the goal in this lifetime, not in some future lifetime. We're not interested in a post-mortem emancipation We're, because that doesn't happen in time. Enlightenment, emancipation is always timeless, so you can't get it in time. You shouldn't think that way. In the remaining six minutes, we may have one more question coming in. Yes, um, this comes from Adam. And uh, he has a question about offering food uh, during puja and which way of offering food is more suitable for customs? He's doing personal worship at, at home. Is it, is it okay to leave the offered food there until it starts decomposing, or after the ritual, taking it and eating it with your Sangha members? All right, so the question, in case live streaming audience couldn't hear it well, is about food. We're coming. Food is the basis of spirituality, so it's a sacred topic that comes up a lot in, in satsang. Uh, in this case, uh, talking about conscious offering of food at, uh, at home, or even at the temple or in the shrine. Um, it's called prasad, or trans transforming regular food into sanctified food. It's actually one of the things we need to do in our culture is begin to uh, say mantra over the food, not just a prayer of thanks, because a prayer of thanks, uh, God doesn't really need to be thanked. And in fact, nature is the producer of food, not God. 
God is, uh, is just pure conscious awareness. And you're going to have to rise out of the realm of food in order to realize God. But as long as you're here, then uh, we find out that food is being produced all the time by nature and by and nature has come out of the human mind. So if the human mind is not in a fine and fettle condition, if it's in an impure condition, then the food that it takes will uh, also be impure and it will turn into pure blood and disease, which is why so many people are suffering from diseases and looking for remedies that are uh, that are really f uh, would be eradicated from the from the whole situation if one did mantra over the food consciously. So, w with that as a sort of explanation to our audience uh, looking on, that um, the question is: Should uh, after you bless the food, and is it all right to leave it? No. Uh, you could you could cover it. You could of course refrigerate some of it if it doesn't all get eaten. But it should be taken simultaneously to the right away after you leave the premises of the shrine room. Then distribute it quickly amongst the devotees. Um, let them have sanctified food right away. Uh, sometimes people can't take certain kinds of foods. Sri Ramakrishna had a solution for that. Uh, if they'd offered him something that he, his digestion couldn't manage, for instance, he'd just take a grain of something, put it on his tongue. Okay, I have taken prasad. I have taken some sanctified food. So sanctified food is purifying of the blood, and the, then purifying of the mind, and purifying of the mind's thoughts, and finally uh, leading to the highest condition, which is beyond. In fact, what we say, Brahmar Panam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagnau, Brahmanahutam, Brahmaivatena Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadhina, fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna's words to Arjuna, is all about everything being food. And that's one level of the teaching. And the next level of teaching is that uh, that uh, that the one offering the food, the one partaking of the food, the act of offering, the act of taking, all of that is holy. And if you undergo the taking of food in that holy atmosphere, then senses and mind, even body, become pure. And with those pure body, with that pure body, those pure senses, and that pure mind, one can reach samadhi, brahma karma samadhina. You destroy all karmas, and you gain the highest state of awareness. One more question. One more minute. One more minute. <laughs> so, with that simple quest answer to a simple question, yes, have the prasad distributed right away. Uh, it can be stored uh, for a while, of course, but it, of course, shouldn't be served if it uh, if it outlives its shelf life, as they say, or its date. Then best to be taken right away, and then uh, also can be saved if it's got uh, uh, good quality. You can be served again later. So we've run the gamut of questions in spiritual life from samadhi right on down to food from the highest to the most basic. And all of that is food for thought. It's also uh, food for questions because that's also a kind of nourishment we take. Uh, answer, questions and answers, answers, that process is, is eating of jnana yoga, that is uh, wisdom. It's what your mind feeds on or should be feeding on in order to have a healthy spiritual life. Healthy bodies are one thing. We want to make sure that our holism, that word is being used nowadays pretty much just in terms of food and diet and exercise, but real holism according to beings as far apart in time as Lord Vashishta in, in Ramchandra's time and Patanjali uh, after uh, a couple centuries after Christ have talked about holism in terms of uh, pure mind pure spirit, pure mind, and then uh, coming down from there to pure body, as far as it goes. So our holism has to, con uh, to take into consideration the kind of food that our mind is ingesting every day, our thoughts, how healthy they are, 
not just positive thoughts either, but actually thoughts that um, tend to go beyond positivity and negativity, klista and aklista vrittis, vibrations that are good and vibrations that are bad, and arrive at that vibrationless place, which is called samadhi. That also should be a very important, or is the most important part of our diet in the world, as long as we have an embodied condition. So here, I think, is arriving just at our one hour of satsang is completed. I'll end with a chant here, and hopefully see you all on our live streaming class this afternoon. Om Sato Om Sato Ma Sadgamoya Tamaso Ma Joy Tir Gamoya Mrichor Ma Amritam Gamaya Abira Bira Mayeti Rudrayate Dakshina Mukam Tenamam Pahinicham Om Shanti 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 Lead us from darkness to light, from lower truth to higher truth, from the unreal to the real, and from the illusion of death to eternal life. Reach us through and through, O Lord and Mother of the universe, with thy sweet and benign presence. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om